Okay, one of the biggest topics we need to discuss is the death and dying. When we are caring for clients at their homes, there's always going to be, at times, the topic about death and dying. And this is sometimes a topic that is hard to talk about, but we need to be prepared for this because there's always the possibility of caring for clients that would have to go through this, including their family members as well. So let's talk about terminal illness. Terminal illness is a disease or a condition that will eventually cause the death. Grief, on the other hand, is that distress, the deep distress or the sorrow that a person feels over a loss. So let's talk about the stages of dying. There's the denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Um, these are also stages of dying can be also associated with people, some people that lo lose a limb, for example. You know, they're, they will go through um, the stages of dying or the stages of loss, as we may say, as well. So Dr. Kuba Ross created the five stages of dying, and this is coming from the book on death and dying. The first one is denial. It's a person's refusal to believe they are dying. Anger, the why me episode, the why me effect. It's like, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to my loved ones? Or bargaining, yes, me, but maybe I, I, I deserve more time. Maybe that this is not really happening. Maybe I can do something better. What if I do this? What if I do that? Then there's the depression, the need to mourn and review their lives, to be able to look back at, did they matter? Did they love? Did they create an impact in this world? And eventually the last part is acceptance. Acceptance that death is inevitable and they should just get ready and prepare for this. So with the stages of dying, not every client will go through all of these stages or within this order. But typically this is the stages and the steps that happens typically but not all the times. They may jump straight to acceptance right away. They may skip a step. Or they may go all the way to the end and start back from the beginning. We need to understand the seven common reactions to death of a loved one. There's that shock, you know, especially at one's own feelings. There's the denial, the anger, the guilt, the regret, the sadness, the loneliness because the person's not there no more. They're gone. Okay? The regret, you know, did they do everything that they could. Could they have done something more? We need to be able to look at the factors that influence feelings and attitudes about death. You know, everyone has their own experiences. The personality type of a person, what are their religious beliefs, how do they vision death occurring, what is the afterlife, you know, what are their backgrounds and their culture, you know, what are their experiences in death, have they even seen anybody die in front of them? You know, so what experiences have you had with death? And what factors shape your response to death? You know, your cultures, your beliefs, your religion. So you want to be able to know the guidelines for care when you are dealing with a client that's dying. We need to understand that there are going to be diminished senses. We need to make sure that we care for the person's mouth and the nose, provide skin care, provide them comfort, provide them a comfortable environment, to be there to provide emotional and possibly spiritual support as well. By law, you have what we call advanced directives. And they have what we call a DNR, or a do not resuscitate order. And these should be honored and respected. You need to respect each client's decision about their advanced directives. It doesn't matter what you feel or what you think that they should be doing, it's what the client asked for and what they have requested. You know, you can treat clients with, with dignity when they're approaching death by respecting their rights and their individual preferences. Being able to give them all the dignity that they have, being able to support them, being there for them, being there for their family members as well. So also understand that when people are terminally ill, they have the right to refuse treatment. They have the right to just say, I don't want chemotherapy, even though everybody's pushing chemotherapy to them. They have the right to say, I don't want to take my medications no more. I don't want to do that therapy. I don't want to do that treatment. They have the right to have visitors of their own choosing. They may say that they don't want to see somebody no more, that they don't want that person there. 
they have that right to privacy to make that determination who should be around them. One of the most important part of your job as a homemaker, as a caregiver, as a home health aide, is treating the dying client with dignity and respect. It is important to do the same things that you do for other clients, such as explaining procedures, keeping the client covered during procedures, and refraining from talking about the client as though he or she was not there. Nothing has changed. You still need to respect them. You still need to do the things for them that is required. So when we have clients who are dying, and at times there may be several additional care that may be given, additional care from what is being given right now, you have what we call hospice, palliative, and respite care. Hospice care is a holistic approach. You know, it's a compassionate care that is given to dying people and their families. Palliative care, on the other hand, is a care that focuses on the comfort and the dignity of the person who is very sick and or dying, rather than on curing him or her. Respite care is that type of care that provides a temporary break from tasks associated with caregiving. Understanding the whole holistic approach that hospice, hospice care uses, and we need to know these following goals. The comfort of the client, the dignity of the client, those are important to be able to look into. Some of the priorities for the home health aid in a hospice situation is to be able to relieve the pain, to be able to follow the comfort measures, provide personal care, have that emotional support, to be able to still give that client that independency that they still require, to be able to give them the control to make decisions, and also being there to be able to provide a break for the family because the stress that's occurring right now is a lot for the family members. And by being there to provide the care, to give them time to actually cope and think about what's happening is an important thing. And other than observing the client, we should see and also possibly be part of the care of the family members to be able to observe, you know, are they having episodes of stress that could possibly be addressed? The goals of hospice is literally meeting the client's physical, emotional, social, and their spiritual needs. So why is the focus of hospice care not on wellness or recovery? Well, because it's been agreed upon that the patient is dying. The patient is unable to fully care for themselves no longer. And so what we want to be able to do is to be able to not help the person recover, but to actually make them comfortable. So let's look at the skills and attitudes that you needed that you are needing to have when you're providing assistance in hospice. You want to be that good listener for the client, for the patient, or for the family. You want to be able to provide, you know, privacy and respect their independence. Once again, be sensitive to their needs, both the family members and the clients. You want to be aware of your own feelings and be sure to follow up the plan of care still. So here are additional points about hospice volunteers. You know, other than you being a caregiver, a homemaker, or a home health aide providing services for the client, there are additional other people that are involved that can help within a hospice community. You know, if you didn't know that there's actually an estimated almost of a half a million volunteers that provides care to over 1.5 million people who have used hospice. To become a volunteer at a hospice, if you are looking into doing this, you need to be trained and you need to follow their rules and, and regulations. Some of the basic care or volunteer work you can do includes care for the home or the family, driving, doing some errands, and even providing emotional support. Now, let me ask you this. Would you prefer to be a hospice volunteer or a hospice aide? And why? There's a lot of people that I know that are hospice aides or home health aides or homemakers, and they work for the company and get paid, but at the same time on the side, they also still volunteer because they love what they do. They love caring. So when we're providing care for the clients, when we're providing care for the family members, we sometimes forget about ourselves. So when we are involved in the death and dying situation and we are exposed to that, we also need to recognize that there is some stress that happens to us as well. And we should be able to talk to people that we know and talk about the problems or think about and talk about things that we're thinking. You want to be able to take care of yourself as well, eating right, exercising, and even giving yourself a break or a rest. And at the same time, it is also feeling not guilty. 
Don't feel guilty why this person is deciding to do this. Don't feel guilty that you can't help them. You're helping them by being there, and that's important. So some of the signs and symptoms of people that are approaching death or is right there or pretty much what they say knocking on the death's door. You have Shane Stokes, which is, you know, alternating periods of slow and irregular respirations and rapid shallow respirations. Uh, they start talking about this as the death breathing. Another thing that you will hear is rigor mortis. You know, it's within the Latin terms for the temporary condition after death in which your muscles in the body become stiff and rigid. So if you hear stories how a person died and their body was just hardened up, it's because the muscles of the body has become stiff and rigid. So as people are slowly arriving to the point of death, you're going to start seeing and hearing a lot of different things of a couple of different signs and symptoms that you might face. They might, they might start having that blurred vision. They might start having the impaired speech, a diminished senses of touch, of hear, of taste, of smell. They begin to start having loss of movement, muscle tone, and feeling. There's that decrease in blood pressure, that weak pulse, that slow, irregular respiration. They may start having that rattling or gurgling breathing sound. They may start having that cold, pale skin look. It's because the blood is starting to more concentrate in the internal organs. There might be perspiration, incontinence of both bowel and bladder, increased disorientation or confusion. And there's also that modeling, spotting, or blotching of the skin. And when somebody passes away, we need to talk about the care that we have to provide their body, their client, that patient. There's what we call the post-mortem care, which is care of the body after they passed away, or the perineum, the genital and anal area, making sure we care for that as well. Because remember, if somebody dies, they can all of a sudden become incontinent. So they may have that incontinent episode, and we're going to have to make sure we clean them up. Just because somebody passes away, that does not mean we do not treat their body of value. So let's look at some of the guidelines we should know about post-mortem care. When that rigor mortis occurs, that muscle hardening or rigidity, when that actually happens, there, it can be difficult to actually move the client to be able to roll them to the side, to the left or to the right or in their back. If need be, ask for help. You want to make sure that the body is actually bathed. You give them a bed bath. Make sure you take care of them. Clean the body out. Check with the family if there's any particular clothing that they want them to be wearing, especially when somebody dies at home and they need to be brought to the funeral, the funeral home and they actually need to be dressed. Are there any jewelries that the family wants you to remove to make sure that it's safe for them? Remember, as a home health aide, even though a person passes away, if there are tubes or other equipments that are hooked up to them, we cannot take that out. That's still up to the supervisor's decision. If a nurse needs to come in and do all that or the physician, make sure that the dentures are, are put in the side and documented and also given to the funeral home as well because that's going to be needed later on. If the eyes are open, assisted shut. We still want to be able to position the body well and Put a pillow under the head. Once the patient is gone and has been picked up and brought to the funeral home, you know, still clean the bed after them. Open up the windows in the room. Allow the room to air out, as they may say. And then if there's any personal items, arrange them. Arrange them carefully. Still give it respect. And always document the procedure as needed. So let me ask this question. Do you think you would have a problem touching a dead body? You'll be surprised how many people I have trained and have answered yes to that. But when we are in this type of position, this type of job, we may face these situations and we should know that we're willing to handle that. It is very important to ask the family members of a client who has died what you can do to help them with. As a caregiver, as a homemaker, as a home health aide, you may answer the phone, make coffee or a meal, supervise the children, or even keep the family members company. There is no one or no right way to grieve. 
everyone handles it differently. There are so many different responses that may occur and you need to respect that and respond to it professionally. You know, when something like this occurs, you need to check with your supervisor before attending a client's funeral. You need to know what the policy and procedures are for workers to be able to attend something like this. You don't want to just accept an invitation, but then it's not required. So always check with your facility on what the requirements and the policies are regarding this. So there is a variety of different post-mortem practices that people of different cultures and religions do, you know, such as they have wakes, they have viewings, whether it's an open casket or a closed casket, and whether they decided to do a cremation instead. Each family, you have to respect their decision and you cannot interject what your beliefs are. Allow them to make that decision. Allow them to make that respectable decision. Remember that when a client has died, whether the client was religious or non-religious, your job is to respect the family's customs and their choices. You know, so can you or have you ever, you know, will you be able to describe some of the funerals you have attended or have seen and how each one of them has differed from each other? The death and dying is one of the most touchy subject but still needs to be addressed. And it's very important to be able to know some of the basic cultures and at the same time is to know how you would respond as a person. If you have never experienced a death and dying episode with a client or with a loved one or somebody that you knew, you need to be able to make sure that you know what to be expected. But at the same time, in the end, just like any services that we do, we need to provide respect and to be able to allow the clients to have space to take care of each other and themselves. So that pretty much ends this particular section. I hope you guys keep on watching. Remember, past CNAnow.com, we know we offer over 1,500 tests and quiz questions, over 23 skill videos online. You have your online instructor that provides educational materials such as these. We have a variety of videos that is going to be able to help you guys pass your CNA examination with your state. We also give you guys some free handouts and free job guidance when you guys actually get your CNA exam. So once again, this is Michael here with PassCNAnow.com. Thank you so much and just keep on watching our videos and I guarantee that you will pass your examination.